infinite, matchless grace freely bestowed on all who believe, all who are longing to see his face. Will you this moment his grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. <clears throat> all right, turn to number 524. Number 524, we're marching to Zion. Go ahead and stand. Um, you'll be sitting for a while with uh, Brother Justin. I heard him say that he did an abbreviated version of his sermon at Lake Ministry this morning and went for 40 minutes. So we'll go ahead and get uh, stretch our legs. Uh, the, one of the verses of this song is interesting to me. It says, if I can find it. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, hang on. Oh, verse 2. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God, but children of the heavenly king may speak their joys abroad. So sing it out if you know the Lord. Hymn number 524. If you don't know the first, if you don't know the song, uh, we'll know it by the end. There's four verses. Start at the beginning here. We're marching to Zion. F 524. <clears throat> Come we that love the Lord, and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord, join in a song with sweet accord. And thus surround the throne, and thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God, but children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King. May speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. The hill of Zion yields a thousand sacred streets before we reach the heavenly fields before we reach the heavenly fields or walk the golden streets or walk the golden streets we're marching to zion beautiful beautiful zion we're marching upwards to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's crown. We're marching through Emmanuel's crown to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upwards to Zion, the beautiful city of God. That's good. That's a start, isn't it? <laughs> it's good to be here tonight. I'm glad that all of you showed up to... To hear me, we had a 
decent uh, amount of people at the lake this morning, and this is, uh, oh, it's the first time in quite a while that I've preached two messages in one day, and I'm excited to be able to do that. You know, Pastor, he always tries to get me, I think, and, um, you know, just give me just a little bit of notice. <laughs> Last night, he called me at 5 o'clock. <laughs> he said, now, Justin, I gave you 25 hours of notice to get, to get ready. You know what? The joke's on him, though, because I was really hoping that he was going to call me because Wednesday night, I realized, you know what? Clay's not going to be here Sunday night. I wonder if Pastor's going to preach twice. And sure enough, he did give me a call, so I'm happy to be able to be here tonight and to share with you. Um, if you brought your Bibles, I am going to be in 1 John chapter 1. <clears throat> we'll see how long my voice makes it. <clears throat> I'm not used to all this talking. <laughs> I'm kind of a quiet individual. 1 John chapter 1. Before I read that, I'm just going to start off with a, a story that I heard not too long ago. You know, I heard um, Satan had a garage sale, and, you know, he's, he's got all of his stuff laid out there like any good garage sale. He's got little price tags on all of it, you know. He's got anger for $100. He's got, you know, resentment for about $300, um, hatred, $400. And then, you know, he's got everything laid out, and all the demons decide, hey, we're going we're gonna to get us some tools. You know, we're going to get us the things that we need to distract people, to take them away from the purpose that God has for them in their life. We're going to get us some good stuff. Isn't that what you think every time you go to a garage sale? I do. I always end up getting a bunch of junk that sits in my trailer. But the demons, they had plans for what they were going to get. You know, they're, they're looking through all these things that, that the devil's got out there. He's got lust. He's got greed. He's got pride, jealousy, gossip, backbiting, selfishness, apathy. You know, he's got all these things, and they look great. And then there's this man there, and he's looking at it, and he, he sees these two little tools over there to the side. And they look like they've been used really, really well. And he goes up to the devil, and he says, those don't have a price tag on them. He said, what do you want for those? And the devil said, oh, I can't sell these. These are priceless. These are priceless to me. He said, if none of that other stuff works that I've got laid out here, these two right here, they'll do the job. They work really, really well. And the man says, well, what do you want for them? You've got to have a price. The devil said, no, I can never sell these. So the man starts to walk away, and he looks back one more time at him, and he said, what are those anyways? The devil looks at him, and he said, that's doubt and discontentment. Yeah. Doubt and discontentment. He can use those two things to get you into any of these other things, to make you mad, to make you resent things, to hate things, to lust. You know, it's easy for us to fall into doubt, isn't it? And the devil, he likes to use everything that he has available. So tonight, if I could entitle my message, it would be, If I Were the Devil, and it's wrote after something that Paul Harvey, if you know who Paul Harvey is, some of you younger ones probably won't, but um, I, you could recognize his voice anywhere. And here in a minute, I'm going to have Justin play this after I get done um, reading reading so I'm just going to read a few verses here and then I'm going to have him play this for you guys to hear it because it's a lot better hearing it from him he sounds a lot better than I do but you know so here in first John chapter 1 in verse 1 I'm going to go ahead and read 1 through 7 <clears throat> in verse 1 it says that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard we declare unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. They don't write them because they want you to be down. They don't want it. You know, he didn't write this to you so you could be sad over the things that you weren't going to get to do in your life. He said, I write these things that your joy may be full, that you go in the right direction, that the devil does not get you off the path that God has for your life. He said, I write these that your joy may be full, who your fellowship is with. And here's the conditions of fellowship. It says, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. 
If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you so much for this day. Lord, I thank you for the time that you give me to come up here and share your word. Lord, I pray that you just touch my mouth tonight. Lord, that you would use me as your mouthpiece, that you would use me as your voice, Lord, that I wouldn't say anything that was of me, Lord, but everything that is of you. Lord, I pray that if someone's here tonight, Lord, and they don't know you or they're not following you, if they follow the devil tonight, Lord, I pray that they would get that right, that they wouldn't wait another minute. Lord, we just thank you so much for all that you do, and I thank you for your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Um, I'm going to have Justin go ahead and play this. And this is actually, he wrote this in 1964, and um, 1965 he shared it on um, the rest of the story with Paul Harvey. He was a newscaster. If this goes like normal, it's probably not going to work. If I hey, were the devil, if I were the devil, if I were the prince of darkness, I'd want to engulf the whole world in darkness, and I'd have a third of its real estate and four-fifths of its population, but I wouldn't be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree, the. So I'd set about however necessary to take over the United States. I'd subvert the churches first. I'd begin with a campaign of whispers. With the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve. Do as you please. To the young, I would whisper that the Bible is a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that what's bad is good and what's good is square. And the old, I would teach to pray after me, our Father, which art in Washington, and then I'd get organized. I'd educate authors in how to make lurid literature exciting so that anything else would appear dull and uninteresting. I'd threaten TV with dirtier movies and vice versa. I'd peddle narcotics to whom I could. I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction. I'd tranquilize the rest with pills. If I were the devil, I'd soon have families at war with themselves, churches at war with themselves, and nations at war with themselves until each in its turn was consumed. And with promises of higher ratings, I'd have mesmerizing media fanning the flames. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects, but neglect to discipline emotions, just let those run wild. Until before you knew it, you'd have to have drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door. Within a decade, I'd have prisons overflowing, I'd have judges promoting pornography, Soon I could evict God from the courthouse, then from the schoolhouse, and then from the houses of Congress. And in his own churches, I would substitute psychology for religion and deify science. I would lure priests and pastors into misusing boys and girls and church money. If I were the devil, I'd make the symbol of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a bottle. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and give to those who wanted until I had killed the incentive of the ambitious and what'll you bet? I couldn't get whole states to promote gambling as the way to get rich. I would caution against extremes in hard work, in patriotism, in moral conduct. I would convince the young that marriage is old-fashioned, that swinging is more fun, that what you see on TV is the way to be. And thus I could undress you in public and I could lure you into bed with diseases for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I'd just keep right on doing what he's doing. Paul Harvey. Good day. All right. So I was trying to, I was thinking about what God had for me to share this week. And I always do that every week while I'm in my car most of the time because I drive just all over the place for work. And the God, God, he has a lot of time to talk to me through messages on the radio and different things. But I just happened to hear this on Facebook. And I'd heard this a long time ago, and I remembered it was really good. 
But then I listened closely to it, what it said, and I was like, wow, wow. God, I think, opened up Paul Harvey's vision to what the future had in store, to where we were going to be as a country, because it could not be more spot on than what we're dealing with right now here in America. I mean, spot on. So what I'm going to do tonight is try and just break this down, and I'll go as quickly as God lets me get through it. Um, like, like Jameson was saying, it took a while longer th at the lake, and I thought that was my abbreviated message. But, um, but we'll see how, what God has in store for you tonight. Um, so here, you know, Paul Harvey's thinking, if I was the devil, what would I do? How could I go about turning people? And the Bible calls the devil the prince of darkness. And that's what he says here. If I, were the, um, if I were the prince of darkness, I'd want to engulf the whole world in darkness. We just read there in um, 1 John, but if we walk in light as he is in the light, and we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So you're either walking in light or darkness. And I was thinking about darkness. You know what darkness is? It's nothing. You know what darkness is? It's the absence of of light. You may say, Justin, man, that's really deep. The uh, darkness is the absence of light. Really? Yeah. Yeah, that's what it is. It's, that means that there is no light. You know what Satan is? He's nothing. He is nothing, and he wants to consume your life with nothing. He wants to wipe out every inch of light that God puts into you. Everything that, you know, I think of, think of like darkness as like, you know, a cave that's been in dark for years and years and years, and then someone goes and views it for the first time, and they're shining a light in there, and they see all these creepy, crawly things crawling around in the dark, you know, these spiders that want to come out, you know, um, possums. You know, I hate possums. I'm stinking things. You know, they hiss. They, they act like they're the meanest thing in the world, and they're the biggest weenies there ever have been. They just lay over there, de act like they're dead. They're playing possum. But, you know, these creepy, crawly things that want to crawl out and get you, and when you shine the light on them, they don't like it, do they? That's what the lost world, you know, they like being in the dark, to where no one sees anything that's going on in their lives. They don't like to have the light shined on them. They're like, whoa, that's something different. I don't like this. I'm uncomfortable with it, and I don't want to see that light, so they try and get away from it. And then those sneaky, sneaky spiders, they'll sneak around behind you, and then they'll bite you, won't they? You know what? That little bitty spider, it's amazing how just that little bit of venom that they inject into you can cause a huge sore, maybe even make you lose your whole leg or take your life. You know, it doesn't take a whole lot of the devil's venom to infect you, does it? To hurt you really bad. Because he wants to use all these tools that I was talking about earlier to take away the light, to remove the light in you. You know who the light is in you? Do you think it's you that's the light? Unfortunately, it's not us. We're just a reflection of Jesus Christ, the true light. You know what the Bible says? That when we get to heaven, that there's not going to be any sun. Because Jesus Christ is the light of heaven. He is, he's going to be all the light that we need. And you know what? Our country, the United States, that's what he was talking about there. He said, um, I'd be happy until I, I wouldn't be happy until I seize the ripest apple on the tree, the. He's talking about the United States of America. You know, our country for a long time was a beacon of light. It's because that we knew who God was. We knew who our Father in heaven was, and we tried to follow him with our laws that we laid down, our institutions were all built around him. The school was built around Jesus Christ. The school, the original school was built on reading the Bible. You know, if you went to a schoolhouse, all you needed was one book. It was the Bible. That's what they learned from was the Bible. Um, colleges were built that so young men could go and learn about the Bible. It wasn't about learning all this other stuff that we've got in there now. It's about the one thing that they've taken out of it now. It was all about the Bible. And the U.S. used to be known for being that light. You know, we were the hope of the world, the United States. Do we look like the hope anymore? You know, when other countries saw us coming in before, it was a great thing to see Americans there. You know what? When we were in World War II and we bombed Japan, who was trying to kill us with everything that they could, it didn't matter if it took their own lives, 
Did we take over Japan? Did we control everything they did? No, we built their country back for them after we bombed them. Does that sound like a nation that's horrible? Uh-uh. We were, we were a nation that cared. We helped rebuild Germany after all the things that it did. You know, Germany was following the devil. I mean, the devil had wiped the light out of Germany. Germany actually was one of the biggest Christian nations at the time that Hitler took over. And then Christians are sitting there sell, having church at the same time those trains are going by with all those Jews crying out, screaming out as they're going to a concentration camp. The devil, he, he can work on us, can't he? But we're supposed to be a beacon of light, and anymore we've lost that light. You look at how we're, we've handled Afghanistan right now. Our allies are saying, those Americans, they don't do what they say they do. They, um, we had promised Afghanistan that we were going to help train them and prepare them to be able to protect themselves, and then we just walk out. I'm not saying we shouldn't have got out of Afghanistan. That's not what I'm saying. But we could have done it in a much different way. We should have done it in a much different way. We should have protected lives. And guys, today we need to be in prayer because there's missionaries in Afghanistan. That I've heard that there's over 200 missionaries in Afghanistan right now fearing for their lives. The Taliban that President Biden says that is not as promised. They promised that they're not going to do anything to Christians or going door to door. And if you have the Bible on your phone, they're killing you. They're killing Christians in Afghanistan right now. So we need to be praying that God will take care and watch over them. <clears throat> so our allies are saying, well, America's not what it used to be. And our enemies, they're even more excited about what they see. China and Russia, I, I see, saw a deal on Facebook the other day where a guy had taken a picture of his TV and on his TV screen was the news and at the bottom was the the uh, heading of what, what they were talking about, and it said, China and Russia join with the Taliban. You ever seen something more scary than that? Two of our most hated enemies is joining up with the Taliban who's just taken over all of Af Afghanistan. Our enemies are standing up behind us, and they're ready. They are chomping at the bits to take America, and it's because the devil has worked in what he wants to do. He's taking down America each and every day. <clears throat> okay, he said, he liked to seize the ripest apple on the tree, the, so I'd set about however necessary to take over the United States. I'd subvert the churches first. Where's he going to start? You think, you'd think the devil would be all about getting the lost people to follow him closer. Who's he got to take down to take the light out of the world? Us, the churches. He's got he's to take down the churches, and he started, and he's worked on us really hard. You know, 72% of church-going people, people that claim to be Christians, believe it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. 72%. These are people that claim Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior believe that it doesn't matter what you believe. I was at um, David Ford's funeral yesterday, and Brother Ford got up and spoke at his own son's funeral. I don't think I could do that. I don't know how he was able to other than the power of God. But he stood up there, and he said, you know, people think there's a lot of ways to heaven. He said, you know, if I was going to go to Dallas, there's a lot of ways I could get there. He said, I could take a train. I could fly down there. I could ride a bus. I could ride a bike, or I could even walk. But you know what? Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life. He said, there's only one way to me. There's only one way to heaven. <clears throat> but the devil has slipped that in the church and said, nah, that's not true. That's not true. He said, I begin with a campaign of whispers. Do you think the devil really wants you knowing what he's doing? Do you think he wants to make it obvious to you? Now he doesn't care. But I think early in the church, he just made it as whispers. It's just a little bit, hey, you can do this. Hey, God's law really doesn't matter. You know, it's not that important. You can, you know, look what that person did. You need to go beat him up about that. Or you need to go do this. It's quiet. It's not anything loud. It's not anything you even notice that you're doing in the beginning. 
and then he continues working on you with his whispers. With the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve, do as you please. Are we not there today, guys? You know what we are? We're selfish as a nation. We have become all about ourselves. Self-fulfillment is the most important thing here in America, isn't it? You know, I want to be the best that I can be and do all the things that I want to do. You know, whenever I get old, I might go and do some things for God. I might give more money when I get older and have the money. I might do this or that for God later on. For right now, it's all about me. It's all about what I can get, what I can earn, what I can do on my own. Mark chapter 8 and verse 34 says... <clears throat> Mark 8, 34 says, this is Jesus speaking, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake in the gospels, the same shall save it. Guys, it's not about us. That's what the devil wants us to believe, that it's all about us and the things that we can do. But it should be about God. It should be, our focus should be put on him and not ourselves. But he's going to whisper that, oh, you deserve this. You know what, anytime you hear that you deserve something, you ought to be having the red flags going off in your head everywhere. Because we don't deserve anything, guys. We deserve death and hell. But we were given so much more Amen. by Jesus Christ. <clears throat> to the young, I would whisper that the Bible is a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. Our young people today are going off in droves. And it's because they're being taught from the very start that the Bible is not really true. It's just something that man made up. Um, you know what the devil, whenever he, whenever he got on this, you know what he did? He started with Genesis 1-1, didn't he? What's it say in Genesis 1-1? In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Not man. Man didn't do anything. But that's not what uh, people would have you believe. That's not what evolution says, is it? Evolution says that we were just a big, huge accident that occurred over millions and millions of years that makes no sense whatsoever. Anything you can look at around you, you can see God in it. You can see that he created everything and that it only works and functions because God put it all together. There has to be a creator and I know who he is. His name is Jesus Christ. His name is God. That's not what they want young people to believe, though. 64% will leave the church between the years of 18 and 25. 64%. And that within 10 years, 10 years ago it was 59%. We're jumping by leaps and bounds. Millions and millions of young people are walking away from the church. And it starts in the school system. I can remember whenever I was in college at Connors, right down the road here at Warner, little bitty school. You wouldn't think, you know, a country school like Connors would, would have atheist professors, would you? They're there. My first day of chemistry two, I'll never forget this. Ms. Trzinski, Dr. Trzinski, was my teacher. And you know what the first thing she started off our class with was? I know some of you are Christians today, and you believe all that God stuff, but before we're through with you, you'll know better. That was the first day of class. You know what the devil, he wanted to start right in the beginning, didn't he? He wanted to make sure and get us thinking, as students, this is a person that we're supposed to listen to, that we're supposed to trust, that they know what they're talking about, to tell us, you know what, God's not real. That's a big fake thing. It's not true. They start with the young. They work, they work their way into the school systems. <clears throat> I would confide that what's bad is good and what's good is square. Is that not going on in our country today, guys? Have we gone to, oh, that stuff you do at church is just so boring you know, that's no fun. You know, if you go to church, they're just going to suck all the life out of you, and you, you can't do anything you actually enjoy doing. You just have to be there and sit there and listen. You know, what's the fun in that? And listening to a bunch of preaching. 
You know, you got to sit there and be quiet and steal. You could go out and you could do all this other stuff. That's what, that's what they say, you know, that good is bad and bad is good. Look how fun this is. The Bible says that sin is fun for a season, didn't it? It's fun for a little bit. And then you get what reality is. You get the reality of sin, and you have to live with that for the rest of your life. I'm going to read to you what Isaiah 5.20 says. <clears throat> Isaiah 5, chapter 5, and verse 20 says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You know, our country looks at all these different things transgenderism, homosexuality, um, racism. You know, they say they're against racism, but they're actually causing racism by the things that they say and do. Critical race theory only furthers racism. It doesn't break racism down. That's what's being taught in our school system today. That's what's being forced on all these huge companies, these large companies. They have to teach about critical race theory. It's because the devil has worked his way in there. <clears throat> What's bad is good, and what's good is bad. In the old, I would teach to pray after me, our Father which art in Washington, not our Father which art in heaven. Our Father which art in Washington. Are we looking more and more to the government than ever? Everywhere around you, it's all about what's going on in our government. You know, our, the founding father set our, up our government to be this small little thing that just helped keep the wheels turning. They didn't mean for it to have absolute power and control over human being, the, the United States of America. They meant for it to just function to help things continue functioning, to help the states get along together, to help the states stay together. Now it's breaking us apart more than ever because it wants to completely control each and everything that you do. I've never seen it more politically charged in our country than what it is right now. I know I'm not that old, I'm 39, but still. Like, just in the few years that I've been alive, I cannot believe the change that has occurred. We focus on Washington before we focus on our Heavenly Father. You know, guys, when you talk to God, we talked about prayer Wednesday night. And when you talk to God, you are praying to your Heavenly Father. He wants you to treat Him that way. He wants you to talk to Him like you were talking to your daddy. He wants you to be, because, you know... They talk about Abba, Father. That is a term of endearment, just showing how much he loved you. That's how God wants us to talk to him. But instead, we say, what's going on in Washington? Look, let's look at the news. Let's not look in our Bible and see what's important. <clears throat> and then I'd get organized. I'd educate authors in how to make lurid literature exciting. I had to look up that word. I didn't know what that meant. Um, Lurid means vivid, shocking, or sensational terms. He's going to make literature lurid and exciting so that anything else would appear dull and uninteresting. Have you noticed the things that most people read? Are they things about the Bible? Or are they commentary on the Bible most of the time? Or things that are really important like the Bible? I look at people's houses as I go into them and I see the books that they've got. They've got shelves full of romance novels. Things that are exciting that they want to read about. Something Tom Clancy mission or, you know, these uh, Grissom. I can't remember his first name. I'm not a big book reader. But, um, I, you know, there's all these things that are so exciting and no one looks at what God's word says. The truth. We overlook the truth for excitement. <clears throat> we overlook the Bible's wisdom. For things that we can get for ourselves. <clears throat> I threaten TV with dirtier movies and vice versa. I look at television now and I, I don't even want to look at it. Man, it makes me sick. It just, it gets dirtier and dirtier and dirtier. You know, I mean, um, when I was a kid, if you heard a cuss word, it was few and far between on a television program. And now it's every other word. And you've got to see everything. I mean, sex is just right out there in front of your face. They want to shove it in your face. I can't even let my kids watch cartoons anymore because you know what's on there? RuPaul's Drag Queen. 
What in the world is that doing on a Cartoon Network commercial? They got to shove it right in your face. They want you to see. Satan wants to make sure he's got he's got your view right here, doesn't he? He's got you focused on that television, and he's going to use whatever he can. He's going to start with the kids, just like we talked about the young. Anymore, you can't even watch cartoons because they all got cussing in the cartoons, or they've got innuendo, innuendo that you, you don't need to even think about. <clears throat> TV has gotten dirtier and dirtier. They, you know, our music has done the same thing. You can't, you can't watch any of those. I mean, which you don't even need to watch any of those uh, music uh, awards things, because now they got women doing things that shouldn't be happening with women on there, right in front of your face. They don't wear any clothes. I mean. The devil knows what he's doing. You just got to look, guys. You, we got to wake up. You know, like I was telling Matt this morning, I was like, I just want to be like Earl Pitts. Earl Pitts was on the radio. He used to be, and he'd say, wake up, America. You know, we have, <laughs> we have lost our focus. We haven't been looking at what the devil is doing. <clears throat> I'd peddle narcotics to whom I could. Think about that, guys. What's one of the biggest things that's going on in Oklahoma right now? Narcotics. And it's not just rampant drug users, is it? It's someone who has had some pain in their back and went to the doctor, and he gives them some pills. You know? He's like, oh, these will fix your problem. Here you go. Try them out. I can remember Dad telling me a story about whenever um, he's a pharmacist, and um, he was telling me about these uh, drug um, representatives, reps. They'd come in, and they would... Give them all these um, handout ones. I can't even remember what they're called. They give them all the handout, and they say these are great. These are the best things ever. And Dad said these got to be addicting. And they said, Oh no, there's no addiction at all with them. So Dad is watching, and he's filling these prescriptions for people. And there's people actually in the pharmacy going in the bathroom, and they take their whole bottle of pills, and he'd find them passed out on the floor. These aren't addicting. These aren't addicting. Narcotics aren't bad. <clears throat> now we're dealing with some of the craziest drug stuff you'd ever believe. You know, as a firefighter, I have to deal with going to these trainings about drug education because we're most of the time dealing with people cooking meth or making different drugs, and we've got to be safe about it. They've come up with this new thing called care of fentanyl. Fentanyl is bad. Fentanyl is really bad. It is extremely strong and can kill you easily. But they came up with this new stuff called care of fentanyl. I was just shocked at what they're telling me about it because they put it into these, these drugs, into heroin and methamphetamines, and they actually, they'll put it into it, and it's this real fine powder. And if a small bag of this powder gets dropped on the floor, if you get any of it blown in your face that fast, you're down. They're having problems with ambulances. Actually, a police officer was arresting someone. They had this in their pocket, and they were escorting them over to the ambulance because they had um, kind of roughed them up a little bit. And on the way to the ambulance, the pl police officer just <laughs> takes a nosedive, and the guy takes a nosedive. So the ambulance people run over there, and they all take nosedives because they've just breathed this stuff in. That quick, guys. And if you don't have, I think it's three, it takes three Narc Narcans to revive someone after being on that. Three of them. I mean, that, it's just crazy. That's an elephant tranquilizer. And it was being sold in our country from, tri from China. That's where it was coming in from. And anyone could order it as an elephant tranquilizer. Finally, I think they're getting a little handle on that. But it's scary because it's been in, in um, I know, an uh, emergency room. A guy was on a stretcher. And the whole hallway, everyone passed out whenever it fell out of his pocket. <clears throat> It's just crazy. Pedal narcotics. <clears throat> and pills are just as bad. It says, um, let's see, did I get to that? I'd, I'd pedal narcotics to whom I could. I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction. You know, you're distinct if you have this little bottle of whiskey or whatever they, they, they have, they can, they can drink it discreetly and, you know, it's just the devil saying, look at this, this is great, you know. He said, I tranquilize the rest with pills. 
You know, I get to see people who have to take medications on a daily basis, and for the first time in 15 years of being a physical therapist, I was asked in a home to fill someone's med planner. I've never had to do this before. I'm not really qualified to do it. I don't want to do it, but the son has COVID, and he said, I can't fill dad's med planner. He's got mild dementia, and he said, I can't fill dad's med planner, and I don't want to get him sick. I haven't been around him. Will you please do this? He said, I don't have anyone else to do it. So I had to do this outside on one of these days. It was 100 degrees, and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, he's got like five pills maybe. I can do that. No problem. And so I'm wearing this trash bag suit because the sun has COVID, and I've got to wear all this stuff, my mask and all that. And I'm out there, and he brings me two bags, Walmart sacks of medications to put in this med planner. And I was like, oh, my goodness. And before I was done, I was literally turning my gloves like this and pouring the sweat out so I could go over and fill a few more. Guys, we are tranquilized with pills. They'll give you, every time you go to the doctor, you're going to get a pill. And then you need two other pills to deal with the, the symptoms that's created by this pill. Guys, we are overly inundated with medication. You know, that's what we think is going to fix all our problems, isn't it? All these medications that the doctors have to give. And if the doctors don't give the medications, then they're not doing you any good. I think we just need to back away from pills and help in this allow the Bible to solve our problems. It can solve so many of them. And hearing truth, people don't want to hear truth. You know, if you'll change your diet and if you'll exercise, no one wants to hear that. They want to hear, I'll give you this pill and it'll make you lighter. It'll make you more thin. It'll calm you down. Instead of finding cures for anxiety in God's word, we want a, we want a quick fix for it. We want a pill, don't we? We want a tranquilizer. If I were the devil, I'd soon have families at war with themselves, churches at war with themselves, and nations at war with themselves. Guys, are we at war right now? Technically, we're not in a war. But every single day, guys, I see it in and out. We have discussions about our family. My family, some of us, we can't even talk to each other because they get so mad at you because you're left or you're right. It's just crazy. I've never seen our country so politically charged like I was saying before. I mean, you can't even have a discussion. People won't discuss things with you. You can't come to them and say, well, this is the evidence I have for this. They don't care. They'll overtalk you and not even have any evidence to share with you. They just want to overtalk you so that you, they silence your voice. We're being silenced in the media today. On the right, they don't want to hear what we have to say. Guys, we're in a battle, and we're in a spiritual battle. You know, I heard a really good message about um, we're being in a spiritual battle and that, you know, in a foxhole that, that no one's fighting with each other. They're worried about the enemy. You know what? Here in America, in the churches today, we're fighting with each other. We're worried about, oh, man, that person, I can't believe they wore that. Or I can't believe that person's doing that. Or, I can't believe they said that. Guys, we are fighting amongst each other. This year... God has talked to me so much about unity. And I so much want for our, just even our church right here just to be so unified that we're solid. But we can't stand on God's promises when we're not standing together. Man, I heard such a good message at YouthCon, and he had pencils. And he said, here, take these pencils and try and break. Well, he had one pencil, and he broke it. He's like, look how easy this happens. Breaks easy. And then he had a handful of pencils, and he's trying as hard as he could, and he couldn't break them. The Bible talks about a three-strand cord is not easily broken. Guys, when we stand together as Christians, when we stand up, we're not as easily broken. But if you spread us out everywhere and we do our own thing here and you do your own thing over there, the devil's going to take us down so easy. It's so easy for him. God, we gotta, guys, we've got to stand together. <clears throat> and then it says the media is fanning the flames. Guys, Paul Harvey didn't know anything about computers in 1965. Paul Har Harvey had never seen a cell phone in 1965. Now we've got social media right there in front of our face all the time, all the time. I mean, you look at people at a restaurant, you look at people doing anything, what are they doing? They're looking right on that phone, and it's just fanning those flames, making the devil's little fire that he started in someone grows stronger and stronger. Whether it's hate between different groups, he's using it each and every day. 
We can't even drive a car without having to look at our phones, can we? How many of you go down the road and look at the people around you? I mean, I drive all the time, so I, I like the people watch anyways. So I'll look over at the car next to me, and I'll look at what they're doing. Most of the time, especially if they're younger, right there. How are you driving looking at that phone? I don't understand. How, how do you do that? Like, no wonder we have to respond to so many wrecks and so many people are dying. It's because the devil has got us. Man, he has got us on that device, and he's got it right there in the palm of your hand where it's so easy. The media is just fanning the flames. <clears throat> and with promises of higher ratings, I mesmerize media fanning the flames. <clears throat> if I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects, but neglect to discipline emotions, just to let those run wild until before you knew it, You'd have to have drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door. You know, I talked about my grandfather this morning a little bit. My grandfather, he was a, a principal at Shakota High School. My grandfather would never have been in the school system today. He was a big disciplinarian. If you weren't, if you were one step out of line, you were going to have a paddle on your rear. And I don't know how many people have came to me and said, your grandpa is my principal. He whooped my rear. There's hardly anyone that I met that did not get whooped by him. And they're thankful for it. I can remember Grandpa talking about J.C. Camp. He was the insurance agent here at Shakota. He said in high school, J.C. Camp hated his guts. With, he hated my Grandpa. Grandpa said I whooped him all the time. He would not just listen. He said he had to get whoopings almost every day. He said I assumed he'd hate my guts for the rest of my life. But after high school, he said it wasn't very long before J.C. Camp realized what Grandpa was doing whenever he was whooping his rear. And he said, J.C. Camp would do anything for me because he knew that I sent him down the right path because I busted his rear. Guys, teachers can't even teach anymore in the public school system because you know who's in control? Not the administrators, not the teachers, it's the kids. No matter what you tell the kid, they're not going to listen. They don't have to listen. They're not required to listen. And if you tell the parents that, you think that's going to go anywhere? Mm -mm. Parents stand up for their kids. They don't listen to what a teacher has to say anymore. Let their emotions take control and run wild till, you have, till you'd have to have drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door, and we're right there right now. You know, he, he wrote this way, way before Columbine ever happened, didn't he? Way before Columbine, but there's no discipline anymore. <clears throat> Within a decade, I'd have prisons overflowing. I'd have judges pr promoting pornography. Soon I could evict God from the courthouse, then from the schoolhouse, and then from the houses of Congress. <clears throat> you know, we see where the Ten Commandments and the Bible have been taken out of everything, haven't they? The Democratic Party just took, in God we trust, out of their, um, whatever it is you call it, their mission statement or whatever, they just took it out of there. You know, it's out, the Bible has been out of the schools for years now. You can't even mention God in schools or you're in trouble. But if you're a Muslim, you can say whatever you want. Just don't tell me about God. You know why? Because there's a difference between Muslims and Christians. There's a big difference. You know, they'll do whatever they have to. They're sincere in what they do, like we were talking about earlier. They are 100% sincere because they're willing to cut anyone's head off that they need to for Allah when a Christian won't even walk out and tell who Jesus Christ was and what he did for, for them. Guys, there's a big difference. And we've evicted him. We've taken him out of every system. You know, I had a friend that was talking to me about um, whenever we were changing the laws for gay marriage, and he said, why does it matter? What does it matter? I said, it matters because that's not what God's word says. Right. We need to stand up as a country and stand on God's word and his laws and not on our own things that make us feel good and, you know, seem right at the moment. He's like, what does it matter? Let them do what they want. I said, no, we can't do that. They are going to do what they want anyways, but we can't stand and say it's okay. That's what they want. They want you to sit, sit there and say, oh, what you're doing is fine. It's not a sin. But we have to call sin what sin is. <clears throat> and it, in his own churches, I would... Sub substitute psychology for religion and def 
deify science. You know, what do we see today in, in the church? Oh, it's all about psychology. It's all about you and the way you feel. You know, it, if you've ever heard Joel Osteen, I've heard him, and man, I just can't handle listening to him. He just sounds like such a snake. I mean, it just it, it is hard for me to hear him because he's like, oh, you know, I just want to talk about God and how loving he is and he just loves you and he wants the best for you and he wants to give you everything that you deserve you know you need all these things we're going to keep the bad out push the bad energy away you know that's that's Joel Osteen I don't want to tell you the truth I don't want to read scripture to you I just want you to make make you feel good about yourself you know what is what is even like Rick Warren um, he's got some really good messages but he focuses so much on you and you feeling good about yourself. He's like, you can't do anything unless you feel good about yourself. That's not the truth. That's not the truth. The truth is that if you understood who the Savior was and what you don't deserve, then you'd feel fine about yourself because you'd be given the greatest gift that anyone could ever receive in salvation. We wouldn't have to worry about all these other things about how we're not being fulfilled in this and being fulfilled in that. Psychology shouldn't matter. If you listen to the news any, they're talking about, hey, well, follow the science, because science has always been right, right? It's never failed. Yeah, George Washington died. He was leached to death. <laughs> okay? George Washington, the man who fought in the Revolutionary War, they said that George Washington couldn't be killed because he would come in and he would have bullets all in his coat and holes in his clothes and he never got shot. But the science at the time said that whatever was going on with him needed to be drained, the bad blood needed to be drained out with leeches. Science said that we lived on a flat earth. Man, they were right about that, weren't they? I mean, science, they know everything, don't they? It's being deified. What God says is proved right every single time when science has a war with it, but we still choose to not believe God's word. <clears throat> and in his own churches, I would substitute psychology and religion um, and deify science. I would lure priests and pastors into misusing boys and girls and church money. I mean, you see it over and over, pastors that, have all this different stuff. I can remember in the 90s, whenever I was a kid, hearing about a pastor that um, said that he needed plastic surgery on his face because all these letters that he was getting in, he was reading them and he was crying over them so much that the ink ran into his face and he needed plastic surgery on his face for this. I mean, as he's flying on his private jet with his millions of dollar house, you know, I mean, guys, we've turned the church into business, haven't we? You know what happened when in Jesus' time, whenever the church was turned into a business? He come in there and he come put a whooping on them, didn't he? He come in there with a switch and whooped all them people out of there. And you know, he must have been scary. Can you imagine Jesus' power to just walk in there with a whip and just start throwing the tables over? All these people that were powerful and had money are running out of the temple. I can't imagine seeing that. I'd love to, though. In heaven, I think I'm going to have Jesus replay that for me. <laughs> show me, show me what happened because I'd, I'd love to see that. <clears throat> By the devil, I, if I were the devil, I'd make the symbols of Easter an egg and a symbol of Christmas a bottle. Guys, what does the devil want to do? He wants to misdirect, doesn't he? Easter's good. Easter's great. Christmas is good. You know, it's the birth of Jesus. It's all about these presents, though, isn't it? Or it's all about those Easter eggs. You know, I've been convicted. I used to really get into doing things on Christmas as far as, you know, with presents and things. But over the last probably about 10 years, I've been convicted about what I'm doing because it takes away from the meaning of the holiday. It takes away from the important thing. And that's what the devil loves to do, just something little, something small as an Easter egg or a Christmas tree or a present. He'll use it. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and give to those who want until I had killed the incentive, incentive of the ambitious. Where are we at today, guys? Socialism is knocking on our door right now. Socialism. What is socialism? Taking money from those who have money and giving it to those 
who don't want to work for money. It's not those that need it, because we have plenty of programs out there that will help people that need it, truly. But when 50% of the population is not working, and it's actually better if you don't work, in Iowa right now, you can get paid $52,000 a year to sit at home through social programs. And I'm going to work every day, and I'm paying 60 to 70 percent of what I make in taxes to someone who doesn't care to work and doesn't want to work. That's not how the Bible says that things should be done. The Bible said if you don't work, you don't eat, doesn't it? I'm not saying we shouldn't take care of people. But the Bible never directs money to be taken from people and given to someone else. You know what the Bible tells us to do as Christians? Give it. It's got to come out of our heart. Not someone forcing us to give it, but it's got to come out of our heart. We're supposed to be the ones giving it. It's not taken from us. That's where socialism is leading us. I have no ambition to work if there's no benefit in it for me. Why not just stay home? I couldn't do it. I'd go nuts. But... I've, I've got to be doing something all the time, and my wife loves me for that, I'm sure. Not, not really. She'd, le she'd rather see me relax a little bit, but, um, but I, I just can't. I've got, to, I've got to have something going all the time. <clears throat> and what do you bet I could get whole states to promote gambling as a way to get rich? I can remember back whenever I was a kid, and Preacher Ford was preaching about we've got to stop this gambling bill that's fixing to come through. This, Because he said, look at liquor by the drink. That was one of his things. He's like, look at liquor by the drink. We let that go as Christians. We didn't stand our ground on it. And look at how much good it's done our country. And then this gambling bill comes up. And I, I was younger. I didn't understand all the things that were going on. You know what? They ran it as help the kids, didn't they? Help the kids. Gambling will help. If you allow this in the state, look how much money we could give away because we're going to help your kids. What would that help the kids with? Schools didn't see it. Schools are begging for money right now. You know what? Kids are starving because their parents are going to the casino and spending their money that they could have spent on food at the casino. You think getting rich through that makes, makes you um, happy? Now, in five years or less, almost everyone said 70% of people who have won millions and billions of dollars in the lottery and at the casino, in five years or less, they're broke. Most of them commit suicide or say they wish they had never, ever taken it. Money is not the key to your happiness. They will want you to believe that, though. Easy come, easy go. If you work for it, you're going to appreciate it so much more. I'm not going fast enough for my tablet. It keeps shutting off on me. <clears throat> I would caution against extremes and hard work and patriotism. I mean, look at our country now. These people at the Olympics should be happy that they're in America because if another country saw their Olympian kneeling down and getting mad and looking away from their flag when their anthem was being played. Imagine what a Chinese person or a Russian person would happen to them. They'd be dead before they got home. <laughs> you know, and in America we have freedoms here. We have freedom of speech, and if you want to do that, you can, but it ain't right. They want to direct us away from being patriotic and loving the country that God put us in and built. And moral conduct. You don't want to be too moral. You don't want to do all the right things. Then you're just thought of as a square and you're just a goody two-shoes. I would cons convince the young that marriage is old-fashioned, that swinging is more fun. You know, the sexual revolution. That was a time where you can just go out and, you know, do whatever you want. There's no, there's no, um, nothing to be worried about or, you know, the Bible is not really true on that. It doesn't mean you should marry one person and be with that person the rest of your life. That's not really going to be that great for you. How much fun would that be? That's what they say. That's what the devil whispered. That swinging is more fun. That what you see on TV is the way to be. Everyone wants to live like the movie stars, don't they? People that hate their lives, they usually end up killing themselves. That's who we want to be. And thus, I could undress you in public 
and I can lure you into bed with diseases for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I'd just keep right on doing what he's doing. Guys, that's what he's doing today. And I just want to share this with you so that you could see what he's doing in your life. Guys, we've got to wake up and look. As the church, we've gone to sleep. We've gotten comfortable in the things that we do and not been looking and being vigilant for what the devil is doing. He's powerful, but he's nowhere near as powerful as our God. He doesn't hold a candle to God. God tossed him out of heaven on his head and sent him down here and said, you're going to end up in hell. <clears throat> the devil thinks he's powerful, he, and he wants you to come with him to hell. You don't have to go there, though. You know, it's all last week I, um, I shared about Jeremiah, and this makes me think about Jeremiah. He was a prophet. He was in the Old Testament. And hearing all this just makes me think of Israel at that time. How they were turning and going their own ways. They were doing their own things. What is Jeremiah known for? Anyone know? Weeping prophet. It broke his heart, guys, to see where his country had gone, what his country was doing. It was breaking his heart. If you haven't ever read Jeremiah and you haven't ever read Lamentations, that's the two books that he wrote. Read them. See what a broken-hearted prophet that has to go and share with people things that they don't want to hear is. He's telling exactly what the devil was doing at that time. He's telling the people, and they beat him for it. They ended up killing him for it. But he stood up to him and said, and a pastor talks about him all the time. You know, the king came to him and said, Is there a word, Jeremiah? He said, Well, matter of fact, there is, and you're not going to want to hear it. Guys, I know we don't want to hear these things today, and it should break our hearts for the direction our country's going. But you know what? It doesn't all have to be doom and gloom because we have a hope, and that resides in Jesus Christ. It doesn't reside in me and you. God can use you and me to do his will. We have to allow him to do that. He's not going to force you to do it, but he can use us to turn the tide on what's going on. Guys, tonight, I pray that you would look in your lives and see what it is that the devil has whispered in your ears. And you know what? we got these altars here. I'm going to go ahead and have Kristen come to the piano. We're going to have a song of invitation. I'll have you go ahead and stand with me. <clears throat> We're going to sing, but I want you to think about what is the devil whispering to you? He's not going to make it loud, and he's not going to make it obvious. You're going to have to look. In your life, what's he doing? You know, if we would all purpose, just this group here at Lindsay Chapel tonight, if we would all purpose to do God's will and to read his word, what difference could we make in this world? You're the salt and you're the light, guys. Light overcomes darkness. Each and every time it's shined. Guys, shine that light. I didn't give her as much time as you. Please, as Miss Kristen gets ready to play. Brother Justin, thank you. If I were the devil, I'd keep people sitting right where you are right now. If I were the devil, I'd whisper in your ear, you're just fine. Don't worry about what Brother Justin just said. You're just fine right where you are. But the Holy Spirit of God deals with your heart. If you need to come, would you come? He loves you. The Word of God is truth. The Word of God is light. And in Him, there is no darkness at all. If you need to give your life to Jesus tonight, would you come? We're going to leave the invitation open for just a bit. There are people already at the altars. If you need to come, would you come? Maybe you're saved tonight, but you believe the lies of the devil. Why don't you come tonight and ask the Lord's forgiveness for that? And commit your life to his word, his truth. Would you come? While some are at the altars, there's plenty of time, plenty of room for you. I don't believe anybody's here just by chance this evening. You need to give your life to Jesus. She's going to play through one more verse. If you don't come, you'll close the service.
living for Jesus, a life that's true. Striving to please him in all that I do. Just a few more moments. Would you come? As she plays the chorus, oh Jesus, Lord and Savior. I give myself to thee. Amen. Praise the Lord, brother. Thank you very much. And uh, before we dismiss, I want to ask Brother Gerald, if you will, to make your way to the pulpit. And while he's coming, we did get an update earlier this evening on Brother Gil Stadley. Um, he is in stable but critical condition. Um, it appears that his injuries are not life-threatening, though they are very, very serious. And so please continue to pray for him as he is in the hospital in Springfield. Um, and I know that you will keep that um, at the very top of your list. That's a great need. And uh, look forward to seeing you on Wednesday evening, 7 o'clock, Bible study here in the sanctuary. I talked to Pastor Clay earlier this morning, this afternoon. They had a great service today there, and uh, he got to preach. And uh, they're, uh, they're completing the work, and they're going to be heading home on Tuesday, I believe. Um, and so pray for them as they complete that job and as they travel home uh, that God would give them safety uh, in their journey. Brother Gerald, would you dismiss us, please? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the privilege to be in the house of the Lord today. We give thanks for the word of God. Lord, how it guides us, how it gives us a, 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 an affirmation of truth, Lord, not that the world can give. The world didn't give this to us, Lord, and we know that certainly the world can't take it away. Help us, Lord, to, to fight for the truth, to stand for the truth, Lord, and to not allow the, the devil to whisper in our ear and to uh, deceive us and to take us away from what we know is truth and light. I pray, Father, for uh, the Stidley family. I pray, Lord, that uh, the healing hand, Lord, would be upon them during this time, Lord, this difficult time. I also pray for our team that's out in, uh, out in the desert, Lord, working. We just pray a blessing on them as they work, Lord, that everything they put their hand to Lord, would go according to thy will, and I pray for safety of travel as they come home. I pray for our safety, Lord, as we're here, Lord, in this world in a very uh, dangerous time, Lord. We know that, that uh, so many things are going on with people's lives right now, and we just ask, Lord, that the hand of the Lord be on our lives and keep us and protect us as we go our way. Uh, just I pray, Father, the Spirit of the Lord to bring us back together, if it be thy will, in Jesus' name, amen. amen.